Hello, Impact Asylum. My name's Fire Guy, and welcome, as always, to another edition of Hot Fire. This is the Hot Fire episode for the Impact Wrestling episode that aired last Thursday, November 6th, 2017, guys. This is the second show from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, from the Aberdeen Pavilion. So we'll see if Impact Wrestling can keep up, uh... The good wrestling, really. Last week we got some really, really good wrestling compared to the last few weeks. And uh, the only thing missing was a bit of storyline development or conclusions. And we'll see if this episode uh, keeps or performs better, in other words. So let's get right into it, guys. The show starts off with uh, Gail Kim and American Top Team uh, arriving at the building. Then we get a video package on uh, Eli Drake versus P.D. Williams for the championship. Uh, P.D. Williams saying that, you know, we never thought he'd get this chance. It was a once-in-a-lifetime, once blah, 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 blah. You know, the typical babyface stuff. And Eli Drake was like, you know, P.D. is an X-Division guy. He should stay in his own lane. Don't come messing with the big boys, basically, is what he said. And then we start the show off with a match. So right away, I don't know. Starting to show off with a match basically just makes the match just that much better, you know? Like, it automatically starts it at a, a hot, in my mind, just because it's not a talk segment. But we get an X Division six man match as Trevor Lee, Caleb Conley, and Teji Ishimori take on Desmond Xavier, Sanjay Dutt, and Garza Jr. So, props yet again to Garza Jr., guys. Um, I mentioned it when I talked about, uh, well, when I talked about him last week in my, in my uh, hot fire. Uh, big time props to him. He he's coming out with a real a real injury as far as I'm concerned, and he's still performing. Like he he still favors that arm lots throughout the match, and you see that like maybe like that's why it makes me believe that it's true. Like I don't follow him on social media and all that, so I don't, I'm not quite sure if it, it is a real injury or not. Um, I didn't hear anything otherwise, but it seems like it's real unless he's like selling the arm injury really well because he wasn't using his arm at all it was not bumped into once throughout the whole match you know so i feel like it was really it's a real injury but anyways this was a it was a, de- a decent match i would give it uh definitely a warm not 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 hot but a warm uh it definitely yet again one thing i liked about this episode was they all the matches pretty much went the right amount of time just like last week the the booking for these matches have been top notch when it comes to time given to these people so um uh <clears throat> in the end desmond xavier sanjay dutt and garza jr win the faces defeat the heels um basically the big end stretch was uh um <clears throat> what am i saying uh desmond xavier hitting the big his big spiral tap uh on uh Caleb yeah on Caleb I think for the victory um basically it was a big you know at the end everyone starts not tagging and I was just like an all-out war but the one thing I I feel like it it was missing to get a hot was that hot ending stretch like I just mentioned like yes at the end there was chaos the referee wasn't making people tag in or tag out anymore like every tag match that exists in professional wrestling but it just wasn't there was no hot ending stretch there, and that's what killed it a bit for me. So it was just like, okay, they're stuck in first gear the entire match, and it never went like super fast at the end. But man, oh man, it's it's apparent how Desmond Xavier like outshines basically the rest of the X division. Yes, you guys are probably gonna get really mad. Yes, I know Trevor Lee fights better outside of Impact. Yes, he has better matches outside of Impact Wrestling. Yes, most of these guys have better matches outside of Impact Wrestling. We can blame the bookers, we can blame whoever, but the fact is Desmond Xavier is still performing on a better level, in my opinion, than the rest. Just because he has the high-flying X-Division style that the X-Division was based off of. Like... I feel like some people nowadays are taking, thinking the X Division is not all about high flying, but realistically, that's what it always was. Like, it was it's always been that. But anyways, so definitely uh, a warm here. There's not much else I can say minus the fact that it was a good opening match. It would definitely keep, like, this is what they need to keep doing is opening the show in a match, and this was going to keep viewers to get their viewership up. But anyways, uh, after that, we get a, a nice little promo from Sammy Callahan and OVE. But the cool, like, 
broken camera filter put over it. So it's it's funny how the minute they add Sammy into OVE, they don't look OVE aren't losers anymore. Like <laughs> I couldn't even take I when OVE didn't have Sammy before, they were really meh. I never really cared about them. Like to be honest, um, they were guys with masks, but they didn't really play up the mask character. You know, like how example I'm just gonna pick like Abyss. You know. He, he plays the character of being, like, really mean and angry. These guys are just, like, masks, but they talk like normal people during their promos. They went to get lap dances in Mexico, you know? Like, it's it's a bit weird, so... But, yeah, anyways, all that just to say, adding Sammy Callahan really made them pop, and they I feel like they work a lot better as heels as they do than they do faces. Anyways, time for next match here, as Ethan Carter the thir third defends his grand championship against... Fala Ba. Yes, Fala Ba. <laughs> so this match, I don't know. It was, I'd give it a lukewarm right down there in the middle because there really is lots to talk about this match. Like, honestly, um, this is probably a match that people cared, cared the last about this entire show. But at the same time, this is the match I feel like I'm going to talk about the most in this episode of Hot Fire. Because there's quite a lot to cover. Um, first off, lots of people are complaining about the Grand Championship um, being defended like randomly against people like Falaba. Falaba has literally been jobbed out to by every to every like impact wrestler that exists on the roster <laughs> like he's jobbed to literally everyone but magically gets a grand championship shot but i feel like that's the whole point that's how the grand championship has been since day one there's never been a grand championship match without the championship in it you know there's never been like just a normal singles match with three rounds and judge this decision and because there's no real division it's anyone can challenge it you just have to play by the rules of the championship which makes sense, really, in a way. And this match also proved that Falaba can be something bigger than a jobber. Like, personally, in my opinion, Falaba and Mario Bakara could be something better than a tag team jobbers. But, like, because both of them have really good talent. Like, Falaba proved it here. Like, definitely wasn't his best match. But if you look at his work done in the indies, he's super over. He can wrestle a good match. Um, the only thing is that he can't really be used as a heel because yes, he does have the size, but as you guys saw, and as you guys probably know, he's lack he lacks the height though to go with it, and you can't really be a monster if you're four foot two, you know, exaggeration. But so he could definitely be a good baby face though, the like a solid like mid card baby face. Um, and definitely he doesn't need to be relegated to this jobber role, but someone that is relegated to a shitty role is EC3, like. Um, I don't know, lots of you guys were saying that EC3 is leaving the company soon. I've read it somewhere too that he, he's thinking about leaving, going back to the WWE. If that's true, well, Impact aren't really doing a good job to convince him to stay if they're putting him in these, these mid-card roles. But I mean, like this might also be Impact saying, oh yeah, you, you want to leave our company? Here, eat shit for the next few months before you leave. You know, it might be either or. So who knows? But anyways, to the match itself, guys, um, this match was okay lukewarm like i said um first round ba wins which was completely that's the thing he's a complete jobber so it's completely unbelievable this first round that ba was beating the shit out of ec3 like they should have at least built up ba a bit before throwing him ec3 because that first one was completely unbelievable then second round uh ec3 basically controls most of the match it's like every run in the mill freaking grand championship match. One controls the first round, one controls the second round, and then third round is a bit back and forth, and it's a judge decision split. You know, it's always been like that. But in this case, there's no round three split because EC3 gets the cheap pin on Falaba. So he rolls up Falaba and he puts his legs on the rope, and the referee doesn't see it, and he gets the pin. So it was just a, it was. Falaba got way too much offense and it just wasn't believable like Falaba should have been built up more before getting this opportunity it's just it's just a bit weird like like I'm not saying that Falaba is not the right person to challenge it's just he's missing the credibility and impact to get the title shot but definitely he would have been 
a great contender if he was built up properly and wasn't a jobber, along with Mario Bakara. But, uh, so yeah. So, EC3 retains his championship. Um, there's really not much else to this match to really talk about. It's just a random title defense, really. Um, I'm not going to talk about it. Well, I'm going to talk about it, but it's not really a spoiler, guys. It's just this comes into play later on with the Matt Seidel storyline because I attended the tapings afterwards. But I'm not going to tell you how or what. It's not even that big and important. He just he appears later on. That's all I'm saying. Now time for the next match. Yes, guys, we're going back to back to back with all these matches. Um, I'll talk about it later on in the end. I feel like the planification of this episode was a bit off, but I'll cover that later. Um, time for our... Another six-man tag here as LAX, Ortiz, Santana, and Homicide take on OVE with Sammy Callahan. So, this match was billed as a big brawl, you know, for their hatred and all that. Um, and there wasn't really much of a brawl, really. Like, the commentator was like, oh my god, there's not going to be a single wrestling move. There's not going to be a single wrestling move. It's all going to be straight-out brawl. And yes, it was pretty much mayhem throughout the match, and not really many of the tags were really respected. It was just like a full-out, like, tornado match from the get-go. But it wasn't really like a brutal, like, beatdown of the teams. Like, it was just dives, punches, suplexes. Like, it wasn't the, a brawl style of wrestling like they were promoting it as, or as the commentators were saying it as. So, it was, it was just missing that heat, I guess you could say, of the match. So, I don't know. I'll still give it a warm because the match itself was good. It was just the way it was being portrayed and commentated by by the commentators and how it was billed as. It just didn't come off, at, come off like that at all. But it was quite good to see Homicide back in the ring. Um, definitely, you see that his moveset's a lot, bit, a lot uh, more constricted now. He, the injuries are catching up to him, and that's probably why he's fighting a lot less. I'm pretty sure he is, like, half-retired or, like, semi-retired, you know. He's going to fight, like, a la Brock Lesnar twice a year. But, you know, so be it. But in the end, I'll just say it. Uh, LAX win. Basically, it was, a, it was a tight finish, though. OV were about to hit their big triple person, well, three-person finisher. And then LAX countered, and they hit their triple finisher on uh Jake Crest I don't even I don't I keep confusing the brothers which one's half naked which one's always dressed like <laughs> I gotta remember it like that but yeah uh I think it was Jake Crest yeah the one that's dressed that doesn't go shirtless <laughs> but anyways um now for a segment here where um it's AT. AT ATT. I was, just about, I was about to say AT&T, not the telephone company, but American Top Team and Lashley returns for the first time ever since Bound for Glory to hear what they have to say. So, at the start, um, uh, Dan Lambert comes out and starts roasting Canada, talks about how our dollar is really shitty <laughs> and stuff like that. It's, it's funny because I'm Canadian listening to it. I did get like, you know, it's just funny hearing him do these like cheap pops for heel heat like it's surprising how Dan Lambert can be such a good uh mic worker like he he does he has really good mic skills and it's it's surprising because you know like he's never had this wrestling experience and I guess he's just a natural on the mic like obviously it's, a, it's amateurish you know doing that Canadian like the Canadian jabs and all that just to get some cheap heat but it did work and I got a laugh out of it because I am Canadian so you know a lot a lot of the jokes were you know you know you can agree to, to disagree you know but anyways um he's like we kicked uh, Moose and Stephen Bonner's ass at Bound for Glory we proved that MMA is better than UFC well then what did I say there? MMA is better than pro wrestling. What am I saying? Sorry. I just thought UFC and MMA in my mind and it just came out. Whatever. But then Moose comes out. He says, no, you didn't defeat me. You took it took your whole freaking ATT team to defeat us. And Dan Lambert's like, oh, excuses, excuses. And then uh, Moose goes in the wing, ring. He's like, I'm going to beat your ass. And then he, of course, gets jumped. I don't know why Moose thought that was going to work. Uh, Lashley and the American Top Team arrive, beat the shit out of a moose, 
But then Storm, out of all people, appears and cleans house. And then Storm cuts a babyface promo like never before about pro wrestling and what it stands for and all that. Saying it stands for the chance, the you suck, this is awesome, holy shit chance and all that. He said that he was here for, he's been in the wrestling business for 20 years. He started off, well he didn't start off, but he was like, uh, he talked about all the big part, groups he's been part of in wrestling, like America Was Most Wanted, uh, Beer Money and all that stuff, and just the whole time just baby face to the max defending pro wrestling, and it worked. It was fucking awesome. Um, really good job from James Storm. Like, as always, James Storm is probably one of the best talkers that uh, Impact has. He's able to cut a good promo, and when he goes when he goes full babyface mode like that, it works. It's a really basic like concept, but it works really well in James Storm's case. And in the end, he's just he of course ends with "I am the cowboy, James Storm." You know, um, so really, really good promo. I'll definitely give that a hot. It was a really solid promo. Um, Dan Lambert yet again with the great mic skills. James Storm with the awesome mic skills. Um, and then Moose to be it, to continue the storyline, and the skinny eight American top team guy that takes and eats all his shots. <laughs> Cause I don't know why, but it's just funny. They just picked on the skinny kid. But yeah, after that, um, Lashley's in the back with American top team. Cam comes up to them and he wants to join American top team for some reason. And Lashley's like, "You want to join? You want to join? And then prove you can join. Prove yourself." And then Cam's like, "Okay, I'll prove myself. I'll prove myself." <laughs> so. I don't know where they're going with that. I hope that's not a full thing. Um, uh, I I do agree with some of you guys at Impact Asylum, especially Papaya, if you're listening to this. I do agree that KM has to be pushed, but not, not into this. Not into this. It's not. It, no, it just it can't. You can't. You can't just. You just can't put KM into this storyline. It's just not gonna work that way. Uh, after that. Eli Drake cuts a promo saying that he's going to, well, it's the backstage segment, says that he's going to kick Pete Williams' ass, and then Pete Williams, uh, well, then Eli Drake says, yeah, Pete Williams can't last, like, more than five minutes with him in the ring. Um, he says he might be the Canadian hero, but he'll never be champion. Um, then after that, we get a Pete Williams package just showing how he's been in TNA for so long and the X Division champ a few times, stuff like that. And then uh, after that, we get Ali meeting up with Gail Kim backstage. Ali's telling Gail Kim that she's been her inspiration her entire life and thanking her for being, for helping her in the ring and challenging her in the ring and all that. And then we get a really well done Gail Kim video package going through all her big, huge matches that she's had in her entire history with TNA. Uh, Huge matches with big stars like Awesome Kong, Taryn Terrell, and a few others. Just all the matches, the big, big spots that define Gail, Gail Kim's career in TNA. And it was just really, really well done. And this starts the big goodbye for Gail Kim. As right afterwards, we get the Gail Kim talking segment where Borash introduces her to the ring uh, and before and then Gail Kim comes out with Ali. Well Gail Kim is out then Ali comes out and Ali uh, just claps for Gail Kim basically in behind the scenes doesn't really do anything much in the segment. Uh, Kim says that she, she talks about growing up in Canada how she fell in love with wrestling. She went to the a wrestling school once and fell in love with it knew she wanted to do it for the rest of her life and her dreams came true because of TNA she thank she thanks all the re- the women she wrestled huge matches with so like I said earlier uh, uh awesome Kong Taryn Terrell Molly Holly Lita Trish Stratus like all the big big people and the big wrestler wrestling matches she, she's had in her life and she says she's at peace, she's content with making this decision uh, to give up the title. She wanted to go out as champion. She did manage to do it, and now she's vacating the knockouts title. She thanks the fans, Ali, the company. She 
then she gives the title in and she says she's officially done with wrestling. She is retired. So that was it was a really n- nice segment. Yet again, I'll give this I'll probably give this a hot yet again like um really I it was a really simple but effective segment. Like it sucked a bit that they didn't they weren't man, they weren't able to bring in all these uh ladies along with Ali to go in the background and clap cuz and then did hug and shake hands with her or whatever. But it it still worked. Like that that video package at the start and then this it was simple. It wasn't overdone. She said what she had to do, but it worked. And for people that have been watching Impact Wrestling as long as me and as plenty of others at Impact Asylum have, we understand the impact she's had on Impact Wrestling. Pun maybe intended. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, she she. If you think Knockout, you think Gail Kim. You think. Taryn Terrell, you think Awesome Kong, like all these people that they've had huge matches and what created women's wrestling, in my opinion. Take that with a grain of salt. I know some of you are going to be against that, but basically these kinds of people are what created or brought women's wrestling to what it is nowadays. So definitely awesome uh it does open the door now since Gail Kim, you know, she was getting the John Cena kind of booking, uh, always winning titles, always winning matches, and now that she's she's gone, uh, she, we will see other stars rise up now in Impact Wrestling and see more of a diversity in champions. Yeah, she's still with the company. Uh, she is still a trainer, uh, not a booker, but a talent recruiter, a recruiter and stuff like that. And s- reportedly, she's interested in working the creative team. So we'll see if that, how that turns out. And uh, for sure, um, I wouldn't be surprised if Gail Kim does do more on-screen appearances later on, just not in the ring. So after that, we go behind the scenes and we get a Joe Park, well Joseph Park and Grado segment. So I like that the fact that they're 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 not just leaving this like storyline just bleh, after Bound for Glory. This was the storyline I was the most worried about because I thought they wouldn't touch on it again. They'd be like, well, okay, that's it. That's all. You got the ending of it. Abyss 1. But it's cool that they got this tiny segment in just to really confirm things. So Joseph Parks, uh, uh, Joseph Parks in catering and he wants to talk to Grado and say what happened at Bound, and explain what happened at Bound for Glory. He's, he says that yes, he knows he's Abyss. He knows he knows that Abyss isn't his brother. He just can't make himself believe. Like he just doesn't want to make him. He just don't, he just doesn't want to admit it to himself that he is Abyss. And he says he'll never be Abyss again. He promises. And he says, from man to man, here's your visa back again. But then, <laughs> an RCMP Mountie guy <laughs> appears in the background, grabs Grado's visa, and he's like, "Oh, this is a good visa, but it only works in America and not in Canada." And he says, you're going to have to come with me. You're leaving Canada. <laughs> and he drags Grado away. So, obviously, they couldn't they couldn't have a serious ending to this comedy storyline. Uh, obviously, the Mountie killed me. Like, it made me laugh quite a bit. It was just over the top. Just stupid, wacky stuff. And it works in this case, honestly. Um, but at least we got a good ending to, great, to the Grado storyline. Obviously, with the Mountie saying that it's good in America... Don't be uh, surprised if we see Grado come back later on down the road. Um, probably pretty much next set of tapings, because I don't think I don't think next set of tapings are going to be in Canada for Impact. They're probably going to be down in the states again. So we'll see what happens. So now, before the main event, we get Jimmy Jacobs. He arrives and joins commentary. Really funny jab yet again there uh, towards really WWE. Um, Jimmy Jacobs asks. Uh, Josh Matthews, why he didn't upload that selfie with him yet to uh, Twitter. <laughs> That's just a funny jab towards uh, WWE because for those who don't know, he was fired over a few photos, I guess you could say. Um, but now time for our main event here as Eli Drake, you TNA Impact Wrestling Championship versus PD Williams. 
So this match was a hot. This is probably one of the best main events that Impact has done in a while, and I will stand by that. It was definitely hell. It was probably one of the best Eli Drake matches I've seen in Impact Wrestling as well. The closest one probably being the Eli Drake versus El Patron match that happened earlier this year as well. So this match was just really well made from start to finish. It was just they hit it from the start all the way to the end. It was never there was never a dull moment. It was always really really fun. Uh, one there's a few things I really enjoyed about this match was. The hype spots and the babyface spots for Petey Williams. You actually believed it. Like, Petey Williams got some awesome close falls. Had some awesome uh, babyface moments where he got good, good comebacks. And we were actually believing it. Believing and falling for it. And it just really, really worked well here. Another thing I wanted to say was the lack of interference from Chris Adonis. Which helped this match amazingly. Yes, he got involved a few times. It was just like, grab the foot, grab the hand here and there. You know, it wasn't that much. And it was good because it gives Eli Drake a clean win. So, yes, Eli Drake does win this match, but I don't think you guys were expecting otherwise. Um, so, the ending stretch was basically Petey Williams hits a, a power bomb. He is about to hit the Canadian Destroyer, but Drake counters it and hits the gravy train for the win. So, um... Back to what I was saying, uh, yeah, so really good clean win for uh, Eli Drake, and this is what Eli Drake needs to get some credibility, is getting these clean wins under his belt instead of getting Chris Adonis to interfere in every single match he does. So yeah, um, just awesome planning from start to finish. It went about 18 minutes, and it was yet again a well-timed match. Usually 18 minutes is a bit long for a main event, in my opinion, for Impact Wrestling, depending the people fighting, but this match flew by in a hurry. It was just really, really good. Um, basically, it was just... Uh, just no, there's not much I can say. It's just how it was just good. There's no bad to say about it. It was perfectly executed from start to finish. Petey Williams was an appropriate challenger, of course, being in Canada. Uh, definitely, I'd call him like a filler Challenger, you know, just for because they're the sake, just for the sake of him, them being in Canada and Eli Drake needing a challenger just to keep his momentum going, you know. So it does work, and it gives us a good like pause, I guess you could say, in between uh the Eli Eli Drake versus El Patron versus Johnny Impact storyline. So that's the end of this episode of Impact Wrestling. Overall, the rating I will give it is a hot. Yet again, definitely the wrestling was good this week. I wouldn't say it was as great as last week, minus the main event. The minus the, the main event pretty much was awesome. Um, but the rest of the mat, re, rest of the wrestling was really good as well. Uh, another thing they did better than last week was continue the storylines or conclude some of the storylines, like Gail Kim, uh, the Grado versus Joseph Park storyline and stuff like that. So. This is felt more like an at, like a uh, the follow up to Bound for Glory than last week did. And, now, and also another plus is uh, not having international content shown. Um, I'm personally not against it. A lot of you guys in Impact Asylum more like really really hate uh, the international stuff. I don't mind it. I I see the purpose in it. I enjoy it. But some of you don't, and that's fine, you know. So overall. Fantastic show, my rating, hot, and that's all I had to say for this episode of Hot Fire, guys. Um, so I'll end this off here. One last note before, uh, stay tuned. More stuff is going to be coming out this week that I'll be part of. I'm not going to spoil what it is. Just letting you know that I will be appearing in more content in uh, the Impact Asylum world or Impact Asylum website. So yeah, my name is Fire Guy. Thank you for tuning in, and thank you for listening to this episode of Hot Fire. And I will see you next week for another edition of Hot Fire.